Okay, uh, this is going to be panel discussion for high frequency cheating. And uh, we're going to organize this way. The, um, uh, there are going to be four panelists. The first one is uh, Sal Armak, uh, here. And he's partner and co founder and co head of equity trading from Famous Trading LLC. And the second panelist is Austin Garrick from uh, SEC and concurrently a uh, senior research fellow in complex networks, SIE Business School, I think I pronounced right, right? Uh, University of Oxford. The third panelist is Peter Natchett, and is from founding member and head of operations, 12 Sided Technology, and he was, I think, the senior advisor for Modern Market Initiative. The last panelist is uh, uh, Christopher Naki, yeah. uh, he's founder and CEO of Core Group LLC. Yeah. So we're going to have two parts for the panel discussion. The first part is the organized session. We have about uh, 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 we have three sets of questions related to the uh, maker taker pricing model, and uh, these three set of questions are important. And uh, so each of these uh, four panels is going to make a statement, somewhat statement, uh, up to five minutes. That this is what we call an open end session. Then we're going to enter into something called a jungle session. And they're going to ask each other questions, and you can ask them questions. The only rule is that there's no rule. <laughs> okay, let's get started. Here are three questions. And, uh, you know, you guys already take a peek at the questions before. So who wants you to get started first? Okay, so ah, it's your turn. Five minutes, okay? You bet. And don't worry, it'll be less than five minutes. So, real quick, first of all, I want to thank Paul for inviting me. Uh, Mr. Schultz has the granddaddy of all, uh, of all market structure, academic work that really impacted public policy, the Christy Schultz paper. Um, and it's because of that, uh, of that paper, or partially because of that paper that my former alma mater, Instanet Corporation, actually did quite well. So thank you for that. Uh, secondly, I'll, I should say this really quickly. Uh, I'm scared of three things. I'm scared of New York Stock Exchange floor traders from Staten Island. I'm scared, I'm scared of being an Italian guy in an Irish neighborhood. And I'm scared of being in a room with so many SEC employees. <laughs> uh, so we're going to talk about HFT. And so many of these papers are about HFT. and. Quite frankly, what is high frequency trading? My partner was on a CFTC panel to define it. Uh, it took six, you know, five or six people months to still not come to a consensus. There still is no consensus today. What is a high frequency trader? Is it one of these guys we're reading about the, the SEC fines in the last year, banging the clothes, spoofing, et cetera? Is it Virtu? Is it an electronic market maker? Is it a wholesaler like Citadel? Um, I mean, it, and they all dance in each other's territory. So first of all, this is not very easy um, to, to label and, this, and decide what is HFT and what isn't, and what are HFT strategies and what aren't. But the first question there is, we're addressing is, how would HFT strategies, whatever they be, be uh, maybe be affected by uh, if the maker-taker fee structure is eliminated? I've been so in favor of having that maker-taker system eliminated uh, for years now, going back to 2010, and this is why. I believe it distorts pricing. It, it distorts pricing in several ways. It, A, on the exchanges, and it's also going on in the dark pools, just so you know, there's maker-taker inside the dark pools. But uh, creating these incentives, um, we're getting folks away from buying the security because they think it's going to go up and selling the security because they think it's going to go down. And instead, we've encouraged these games to mastermind and capture a rebate or rebate arbitrage. Uh, as someone pointed out on an earlier panel, you can provide liquidity, get a 33 mil rebate, and if you have to turn around and sell it to the idiot behind you in line, which would be me, I'm the slower guy, I'm always the idiot behind the line, you can sell it to me flat and still make money risk-free on that on, on, on that rebate uh, inverted uh, differential. And I wonder how useful that is. And I also think it distorts prices, maker-taker, because institutional routers 
when T. Rowe Price wants to buy a million shares, when I'm trying to sell a million shares to one of my clients, and we go through these, you know, maybe I use a, a Bank of America suite of algorithms, and this one of the routers starts routing, it's not going to route to the best price. It's not going to care that phantom liquidity disappears because of the way it routed. It's going to go to dark pools, which it has a reciprocal free arrangement with. It's going to go to inverted menus. It's the, the maker taker pricing distorts decisions in, the, in, the, in, a, in a fragmented and, and during times of stress, fragile market. And I have issues with that. <coughs> I'll jump in. Um, so it's funny, uh, so a lot of people, yeah, I did Modern Markets, uh, this is actually my last event at Modern Markets, um, not because I disagree with them in any way, but I have my own company and it's requiring too much time for me to stay focused on MMI. Um, but uh, maybe more applicable than that, for the previous 10 years before MMI, I worked at a high frequency trading company, I think. Um, and the reason I say that is, it's about half the people I ever met said, oh, that HFT company. And the other half said, oh, a trading company. So I don't know if it's HFT or not, but I was at Alston Trading for 10 years. Uh, I built out technology there, uh, maybe more importantly for this conversation, I ran seven different trade desks over my time there. One of them was an equities market making desk. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think of make or taker in, in, in a few ways. Um, one, I think of it as gravy. Uh, we never ran a strategy that relied on the rebate. The rebate was just extra money. Um, if a strategy could not be profitable without the rebate, it wasn't worth running. Uh, and the reason I say that is we looked for sustainable business and a sustainable business mark, uh, model. Rebates were not sustainable. They were not within our control. Our strategies were within our control. We could adapt to the market. But as soon as we had anything based on something that regulators could take away immediately or exchanges could change their pricing model on, it wasn't worth our time and effort. Uh, now there are companies out there who do just try to make the rebate, um, but it's really not worth it, uh, especially I think of late. And in fact, if you look at some of the data that came out in Virtues S1, you can see that many can trade that stuff all day long and make like 100 bucks in one symbol. It's really not worth it uh, to just go for rebate. Um, the other way I look at Maker Takers, a lot of people say, should we have a pilot to see what markets look like without Maker Taker? Yes, we should, and we've had for decades. It's called Futures, Treasuries, and FX. Uh, there is no maker taker. <coughs> Automated trading desks, high frequency traders, market makers, they're all in those products and they have them for a long time. I found it really humorous a few years ago. I read a Wall Street Journal article that was like, uh, that said, high frequency traders looking for new ground in futures. I was like, I've been trading in futures for 10 years and that same author called me HFT when he asked me for an interview. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, there's. You don't need make or take to attract good liquidity to a market. So I, I'm in favor of saying, hey, if you want to get rid of it, get rid of it. Uh, a lot of the MMI member firms feel the same way. Kind of like, we're so tired of the discussion around make or take, just turn it off, let's see what happens. Um, and then, uh, and the, the other thing I do look at with make or take, and this is kind of where I always get stuck with equities market structure, is you can't do anything in the lit pools without talking about the dark uh, pools as well. Um, and <coughs> Right now, we have a really interesting bifurcation of rule sets. It's almost impossible, I think, for exchanges to compete with dark pools for liquidity because dark pools are kind of allowed to do whatever they want and never, and never talk about it. So right now, an exchange, they change their rules, they publish it ahead of time, it gets approved by the SEC. By the time it goes live, four or five of their competitors have implemented the exact same thing. Um, if you get rid of Maker Taker, I think you really have to address uh, sub-tick pricing in dark pools. Because what is Maker Taker for an equities venue? Well, one of the things Maker Taker is, it's an ability to price their, their product at a sub penny level. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say that because no market maker just says, well, Microsoft is $32.30. We say, if I'm making, I get a rebate. If I'm taking, I, I pay, or it's vice versa in some places. There's Taker Maker. And so you build that into the pricing. So you're actually pricing and trading at a sub penny level. Um, so if we're going to remove the ability for the lit menus to price at a sub-penny level, I think we should really take a look at dark uh, pools having the ability to price at a sub-penny level as well. Um, so I, that, that's kind of where I'll, I'll go with my five minutes on that and uh, somebody else jump in. I'm, I'm happy to jump in. So um, I think it's been really interesting listening to some of the discussions today, particularly around the definition of HFT and it's um, one that we're actually trying to solve. We're working with um, some of the top HFT firms 
uh, in the space to come up with definitions with respect to what it means. But there are definitions out there um, in, in terms of it. And I'll, I hope to dive into that a little bit later. Uh, the second thing that I found really interesting today, and I, I find very interesting every time I read a paper or I see a news report, is just in terms of data. So in financial services, the actual data, the availability of the data that we have is very limited. And it's something that we're really trying to push for in terms of uh, reforming SEC Rule 605, 606, um, creating um, a research institute to allow academics to access to information, um, particularly on an institutional level where you can get that parent order information and understand how it works through in the marketplace, I think are, are very important. Um, particularly then when you start making structural changes in the marketplace, if you don't have proper data in order to do that, or if you don't have definitions of who the participants are and how they interact in the marketplace, it's kind of hard to make policy decisions based on that. Um, with respect to it. So I'll answer, no one else answered the questions, but I'll answer the questions here uh, in terms of, so how much are HFT strategies driven by rebates and how would HFT strategies be affected if maker taker fees were eliminated? Um, what's interesting is we've got a little bit of info with respect to this. Um, NASDAQ actually did a pilot, uh, which they started about a month ago, and Frank Hathaway, who's uh, NASDAQ's chief economist, just put out a pretty good report. He always does a good job. Um, and in the report, it showed that there was a 16.8% decline uh, as a result of the reduced maker-taker uh, in the marketplace. Now, I caveat that and say you can't really read too much into the data because with all market structures and with all routers, they're all price sensitive. So those routers are simply going to different price destinations. So I don't think it's an effective um, determination in, in how much rebates are affected. Um, but I do think that you know the reason rebates were put into the marketplace is to promote displayed liquidity in the marketplace. That was the primary reason why Reagan MS was adopted the way that it was. It's taken a, a much different course because we didn't have dark pools uh, well, we didn't have near the extent of dark pools that we have post Reagan MS. We had a couple versus 45 to 50 today. So we've seen a huge demographic shift of order flow with respect to that. So if you eliminate maker-taker fee structures, what's the impact on quality to the marketplace? And now you have to look at that unintended consequence of all the dark pool volume that's out there. And how do you how do you control for that? And one of the ways that you could do that is with a trade app rule, which has been bandied about since 2010 within the SEC uh, in their concept release in January. And so it's a, it's a potential way to get volume back into the marketplace, but you can't do a trade app without um, some sort of reduction in make or take or vice versa. So I think they're inextricably linked in that regard. Uh, and that gets to the point of, is there anything that we can learn from NASDAQ's pilot? Um, we track um, all the exchange and all the dark pool uh, market data, and I know uh, within Frank's report, there was a 4.9% decline of uh, volume on NASDAQ. Um, what was really interesting is, so NASDAQ, from the overall lit venue standpoint, they dropped 77 basis points last month. Um, and so in looking where some of that volume went, it was kind of interesting. Um, the majority of it actually went to the dark pool. So the dark pool volume for the month of February went up by 125 basis points. Uh, also, um, less rebate fee sensitive exchanges saw an increase in volume. So EdgeX saw an increase of, uh, I think it was 80 basis points in volume and of course, I'm not talking about all the different exchanges here. I'm happy to share that with, with anybody in the room. So I think you know you can't just do, uh, an exchange can't do a test on its own to come up with a conclusive result. It's gotta be unilateral, yeah. and you have to look at what some of the other unintended consequences are in the marketplace. And I think you, you know today the dark markets are very real. And I'll just, I'll close with um, Peter's point. Peter said um, the futures markets are trading you know, there are no rebates in the futures markets, but I don't That's think it's true. a fair comparison 
just because the futures markets are vertically integrated. So, you know, there's only one place to go uh, with respect to that. And there are, there and there are as well as incentive programs. Yeah. There are incentive programs you need to rest, but you never right. get paid to get filled. True. Like, True. you still always pay a fee. Right. But you can't trade it anywhere else. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you can't with the You can't with FX and treasuries, though. <laughs> and FX and right. treasuries are the same. Treasury cash and FX. True, but um, FX, of course, you don't have an MBBO. And yeah, and FX might be the shittiest right. market place on the map. Yeah. <laughs> Austin, awesome. what is that? Thank you. Um, so I'll start with a standard disclaimer. These are my views. They're not the views of the SEC. Um, so five minutes for all three of these? Yeah, what are we going to say? Whatever. Okay, no problem. So I guess I'll start by saying uh, why is maker taker important? Why should we expect maker taker to have any effect on the markets at all? And you may think that actually it shouldn't affect anything. And the reason is, it is um, market participants can take into account in their prices the maker or taker fees, right? So for a, uh, um, if, if I have a bid out at 100, then is that bid really at 100? If, if the person who takes it has to pay me a fee, no, it's actually at uh, a lower price, okay? And uh, individuals who participate in the market should be able to take that into account and it's just shifting the prices around of the limit orders, the maker taker fees. So why should it have any effect at all? It's just shifting prices around and people can take that into account. They can build uh, <coughs> their order books that take into account the differences in prices. Well, I think that actually it can have an effect in several different areas. So where does it have an effect? One is uh, for agency brokers, transparency, conflicts of, of, of interest. Okay, so are these rebates and fees passed along to the uh, uh, investors or are they kept by the brokers? If they're kept by the brokers, the, if the rebates are kept by the brokers, then we have a transparency issue, we have a conflict of interest issue. Lo and behold, what you'll find is the ones that, that pay the highest rebates, they um, uh, uh, tend to have the lowest fills for the limit orders and so on. Okay, um, it's what you would expect. So that's the first thing, and I think that's probably the major issue with Maker Taker is uh, these confl conflict of interest and kind of transparency issues that is this price really the price? Well, you know, sophisticated investors should understand that that isn't really the price. You need to take into account the, the rebate that you get or the fee that you pay depending upon wh which market you're in and whether you're aggressive or passive. But it does lead to conflicts of interest. The next one is behavioral. Potentially it has some behavioral effect. Uh, you know, we know in, in, in retail, uh, uh, you may feel like you get a really good deal if something goes on sale, right? And it may be that a completely different retail uh, outlet has the exact same product for the exact same price, but they don't advertise it as a sale, so it feels different. So potentially it has an effect there. I doubt it, but it could. The last one is, I think, also an important one that is uh, in the domain of high-frequency trading. And that is um, the interaction of the maker-taker fee with tick size constraints. So for high price securities, I don't think maker taker should have that much of an effect. Why? Because there aren't tick size constraints. The spread in these high price securities is oftentimes very large. So you have a whole bunch of different prices at which you can place limit orders. Consider maker taker to be a way of getting around those, all those prices. Well, you already have a huge number of prices uh, for very, uh, for, uh, to place your limit order for high price securities. For low price securities, that's not the case. For low price securities, you have tick constraints. You have instances with, where a number of securities are constantly traded with a one penny spread, mm -hmm. okay? And because of that constraint, maker taker allows you to get around the one penny constraint. It allows you to quote basically in fractional uh, pennies. So there's an interaction that happens with low price securities, which potentially can affect high frequency trading. And in my own research, uh, and you know, this isn't internal to the SEC, this was, that was with the NASDAQ uh, uh, database, um, I was finding that uh, market share for high frequency trading was not that sensitive to the rebate fraction of the spread. So the price of the security from low to high, the market share itself of HFT was not that affected. So overall, do I expect there to be a huge change? Um, you know, I'm gonna throw my hat in and say that I don't think overall it would have a change in market share of HFT uh, to get rid of, of uh, maker taker. But what, we, what I did find uh, in the NASDAQ uh, database was that um, low price securities were the, the share of aggressive versus passive trading of high frequency traders was different. They tended to, be, uh, to, to have a larger share of the passive trading for low price securities. And for high price securities, um, their aggressive side was higher. So and this is maybe to be expected because high frequency traders you expect to be slightly faster than others. 
and therefore they, they have, they, for low price securities where Q position is really important, they can get in very quickly. Um, so it could have an effect, I think, and I'm not sure exactly which direction or what to expect, but my guess is that you may see, uh, and it, you know, getting straight to the question, you may see an effect for low price securities because of the tick size uh, constraint uh, uh, if make or taker is abolished. High frequency trading overall share, I don't think it's going to change that much, but it may go from um, uh, more passive to more aggressive for low price securities. That's That would be my hunch. You know, it's, it's interesting that you bring up uh, the fact that a lot of people build books around it, you know, and we can kind of price it into our books, and I think we all kind of mentioned that. But one thing that's really interesting is that there's not an interplay between different rules that are out there right now. So I haven't come across a sophisticated trading firm yet that doesn't build a reality book. And that reality book is a book that tells you exactly what prices are quoted where. But that's not enforced in Reg MS. So if we actually use Maker Taker and the reverse Taker Maker, there are times where we'd all have to go hit the place where, you, know, where you get a rebate for taking um, before we go anywhere else. So everybody builds the books to look like this, uh, to actually have a view of what the, it actually costs with their, their cost analysis, taking into account fees, but then we don't enforce that in the best fit and offer. So everybody views the MBBO at these sub-tick levels, but then it's not enforced in the actual trading. Uh, so that's something yeah, I think you mean in, in protected quotes. In and protected so quotes. Yes. No, of yeah. course, there's the interaction with that as well. Right. The, the, your quote is protected not based on what the real cost of, exactly. of transacting with the order is. It's based on this advertised price. That is, exactly. that, I, I, I guess I've left that off, but that is also a very strong <coughs> interaction, which you can see effects if you get rid of make or take. Yeah. But again, these, the, you, I, my prediction is you'll mainly see this in low price securities, not so much in high price securities. By the way, um, I was just going to say that um, when NMS was being proposed, uh, there was a thought around it that um, with the maker-taker model coming into the market, would you incorporate the price, so the maker-taker price within the quoted price of the marketplace? And at the time, um, the industry felt that there weren't necessarily the capabilities there to be able to do that. I actually think um, if you know, you're, you're looking at it, at it um, instituting something like that, um, could be a way to keep maker taker in the marketplace while still um, having the best execution process in, in place. So I think it's um, something worthy of, of examination if we're going to do a, a test on maker taker. But again, you can't just get rid of maker taker without adjusting the dark uh, adjusting the dark volumes. Yeah. 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 You know, one thing, Maker Taker didn't come come about with Reg NMS. Maker Taker started with a firm in the 1990s, um, you know, Island, uh, who was trying to take market share away from other ECNs mm -hmm. and implemented a, 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 a Maker Taker, you know, I don't want to be, I don't say a kickback scheme, okay, but, um, you know, obviously I, I feel strongly against uh, the distortions uh, created, you know, by this. Maker Taker is, when you boil it down, a form of payment for order flow. Yeah. And as a form of payment for order flow, uh, decisions get, get distorted. Notre Dame's own mm -hmm. Professor Vitalio uh, did a study where he compared, you know, what happens when a limit order Change it. <laughs> I, I have a feeling he's more vocal and loud. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, he takes the credit, yeah. doesn't he? He has much. Uh, you know, but I listen to you guys talk about these uh, these issues. I think that I learned two things for uh, about what we learned from this uh, last experiment, uh, based on your research as well. The first thing is that perhaps it's not important just to choose 100 heavily traded stock. You also need to have some sort of variation in terms of pricing, price of the stocks. Yeah. The second thing is that I think it's not directly. You need to look at what happened to the, uh, to the exchange, to the, to the light exchange. But you also have to look at what happened at dark. In, because you can't, you can, I don't think you guys can actually. Uh, actually, before. step one. Yeah. So NASDAQ, so the, 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 the NASDAQ pilot, <coughs> and Frank Hathaway's work, and NASDAQ put out that, um, the piece last yep. week yeah. where they analyzed what happened with liquidity. And of course, you know, since it wasn't unilateral, their market share went down. But two, uh, there's some nuance of things that they did learn. Uh, first of all, the participation on the exchange changed. So high they saw less ELP interaction, 
but they also saw more investor interaction. Because of the five mills, they saw more of my orders. Um, they saw more of traditional investors come on. And actually, Mr. Hathaway suggested as, you know, this is what you can look for in the next round of what we're going to bring about and what we're going to study. The market quality of the book is a limit order book which has diverse participation. In other words, an idiot, a fast guy, a smart guy, you know, all of us competing in the same order book, does that make it a higher quality order book that's more robust, not only in good times, but in times of stress? And that's why I'm so in favor of, of this pilot, because we're all spoiled. For the last six years, you know, markets have been straight up. And when things are going well, we're like, oh, this is you know, it's pretty great. The Dow's at 17.8 or, you know, whatever, wherever the Dow Jones is or the S&P. Um, and then we forget about what we really should be concerned about, which is how do you protect markets in times of stress, all right? And in times of stress, if the retail order is off in a cloud, you know, Citadel and UBS and Knight, are, you know, they, they bought the retail order. They paid for it, okay? My orders are in the dark. All right, and, and Peter's orders are on the exchange, you know, going like this. When, the, when there's a time of stress, I'm referencing Peter. The dark pools are referencing Peter. The retail is, in, is referencing Peter. And you've seen from your studies what happens, and I don't blame it, it's, it's just the nature of the beast. What happens if the marketplace is only short term traders in times of stress? You know, you get this. So I'll, I'll say that, and, and I think that's a really good point. The reason that Maker Taker evolved into our markets is because it was to serve as an incentive to provide liquidity. So an incentive to get liquidity into the marketplace. And incentives for market makers are important. Historically, they've been able to charge for the business. Or even going back pre-96, um, you know, you could basically take the spread on a 25 cent wide market, which you can't today. So those spreads have compressed. Um, but when we talk about um, difficult and stressful times in the marketplace, it's important to understand that nothing can prevent the market from going down. I, I sat at the desk at Shearson in 87 when the market went down. And about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I couldn't get in touch with the NASDAQ desk. They had just left. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I put in orders to go down to the floor and they went unfilled. So, you know, you contrast that with the flash crash. It happened on a much quicker scale, but all the while you could sell your stock. It might have been in a penny, but you could have sold your stock. Um, so, in, in, you know, following the crash of 87, of course, uh, <coughs> trades weren't cleaned up for weeks on end as a result of that. So, um, incentives um, for the market are important. Um, looking at different ways to do that. If you got rid of a maker taker, what other sort of incentive could you provide? And actually, one of the things I lobbied on for an HFT client was, what if you remove Section 31 fees uh, for bona fide market makers out of the marketplace? Would that have an impact on their ability to um, create liquidity? Um, to sales point, he's right. The, the mark maker taker model has created this um, perverse and conflicted incentive in the marketplace. So we regularly see firms routing and telling the Senate they're ra they regularly route to the destination with the highest rebate, even though research um, from Battaglio and Corwin show that that would be the worst possible execution in the world. So um, again, the other unintended consequence is you need to take a look at the best execution practices of how those work. And today, best X is very gray. Uh, and so it allows a, a lot of firms to have these behaviors in the marketplace that if y you know, everyone was transparent, I don't think you'd necessarily see that. So, yeah. so we had discussed the definition of HFT and that we may want to talk about that? Is that something we could talk about? Yes, of Pardon course. Me. I didn't mean to interrupt. So. Anyone has questions, just feel free to ask. No, it's a free for all. Yeah. It's a free yeah. Yeah. Did, did you want to finish? Your I, well, I'll, well, I'll work with my points anyway. <laughs> 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 okay, so, so anybody? Yeah, yeah. So um, when people talk about <coughs> the fees, right? why the discussion is always centered on HFTs? Why nobody asks whether we have too much competition 
with treaty members in the U.S. for ethics. And uh, uh, a lot of times, make a take a fee change because it's change of grab publish for another time, right? The common being why CME is not doing that. Actually, CME does pay people to make markets very rarely when they want market share. When new products come in on CME, they think it's not going to get traded. They pay market makers. <coughs> it's not well written. Nobody know about. Few people know about it, but they do it. They do it because they want to boost volume in those names. Yeah. But other, you know, every side. It's, it's not actual trade. like payment. Like you don't get a check from the CME. You, you still get payment, you, get you still credit, write a check to the CME. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Bitcoin was a sort of real money, right? So, but, uh, no, it's not. It's actually really expensive. Even with the biggest yeah. discount you can get in some products, I would still write a $300,000 check. It's expensive. So, but the question to the panel is uh, whether you think that the, the right way to ask the question is whether there's too much competition in the market with training manuals. I'm, I'm sorry. Can, can, uh, my hearing is horrible. Can you... Um, what was is, your question? Is Mr. Taker symptomatic of there being too many trading venues, and is that is that really the issue that we're talking about yeah. here? The I, number of venues and, and the fragmentation. Yeah, I, I just say one thing real quick. What I think what's happened in our market structure is we've had the evolution of what I call the Hearst component or self-similarity in the marketplace. So we do a lot of work with just about every HFT shop out there, and I find that their models are not too different from each other. In fact, most of the people that worked at Citadel now work at HRT <laughs> or so on, and they're utilizing the exact same strategies. So they're, these strategies are working very, very much in unison. Now, you go back a decade, um, I'd say you had much more diversity of um, market-making and liquidity provisioning strategies in the marketplace. So I think this race to zero with latency, because that's the only edge available in the marketplace, um, coupled with um, the fee structure, has created this self-similarity in the marketplace. So how do you, you know, change that structure, I think, is, is very important. And again, CME can do it very easily because they are not competing with anyone for their products. Can I just make about comments? I saw you physics, I mean, you have uh, organizations or objects which are self-similar, the self-organized as well, right? Mm -hmm. So are you saying, or are you sort of visioning the, uh, these uh, sort of uh, uh, diverse competing values? They're gonna self-organize, self consolidate in the future? Yeah, if you remove, I, I mean, I think if you remove time as the component, then you begin to change the horizons of what people are willing to do. Today, the, the number one priority in the marketplace is time, right? It's the race to zero to be as fast as humanly possible. Uh, that's how an HFT firm gets its edge in the marketplace, if they're faster than someone else, be it the open, the close during the day, um, and be it with any of the strategies that they're utilizing. At, at the same time, though, we can't get much. I actually am a proponent of believing that the race to zero is pretty much over. Uh, and, and the reason for that is you really want to get to, when you're trying to get to zero, you're not trying to get to zero, right? You don't, it's like the old joke, right? right? You know, you're walking through the forest with your friend and you see a bear. Uh, you don't have to outrun the bear, you just have to outrun him. <laughs> like, getting to absolute zero doesn't help. It's a, it's a, a ridiculous waste of money. Um, you want to be competitive. And to be competitive, you want to get down to the point where randomness no longer impacts you. So your, your goal is to get underneath the standard deviation of an exchange's response time. So if an exchange can only process, if, an, if the variability in an exchange processing your order is, say, 50 microseconds, so it doesn't matter how fast I am, they could impact me negatively by 50 microseconds at any given time, it doesn't do me a lot of good to spend a whole lot of money to get another five mics faster if I'm already faster than that exchange's response. Otherwise, I've just spent a whole lot of money and I'm still gonna get adversely affected by the exchange's response time. So there, there, well, that, that's a really good point. Um, we talk to a lot of firms that yeah. trade futures and are HFT and futures and yeah. treasuries and other um, asset classes, but they don't engage in equities because of the cost infrastructure involved. Yeah, so it's, it's not so just, expensive. yeah, it's not just um, one exchange. You need to subscribe to every exchange, mm -hmm. then you need to build your book, et cetera, and you don't yeah. have that in other asset classes. Maybe, maybe in the we Flash can discuss Boy story, in the Flash Boy story, you know, they talked about the spread networks and that very expensive, believe it or not, is already obsolete, obviously. It's but been six months of it going live. With six months of it going live, and last month, 
There was you know, one very high profile, high frequency trading firm who announced and cited in the reason for shutting its US operations, <coughs> the, 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 the annual cost of that spread networks. It, the race to zero, I think, is well recognized yeah. even among the, the speediest participants. Um, they have no problem if the market slows down. Yeah. Well, so, so the question is, is there overinvestment in technology? Is there overinvestment in speed? Uh, is there a, a, an arms race of some sort in the markets? Um, how, how do you determine what the optimal type of technology advancements in the market or speed in the market? How do you determine that? So I, I've done some uh, analysis on this. Um, and uh, I, I think that there can be an overinvestment in speed. I think the speed can be very good in markets. Um, and uh, I'm not quite sure if everyone, if, if, there, if, if anyone else has kind of tackled the reasons why speed are important. And I think there's a lot of people who don't understand why speed would be important in the market. So I can maybe um, uh, just bring up why I think speed is important. So, Information arrival in the market. You may think speed is important for information to get into markets. I tend to agree with that. But the type of information I'm talking about is not information like news releases. It's not information like uh, um, analyst estimates uh, coming uh, on the market and so on. It's, it, 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 it's order flow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the main reason why, uh, the main uh, uh, um, kind of venue for information to get into markets is through order flow. Or it, it, it is just an empirical flat. In fact, order flow correlates with future price movements. Okay, so it, if you want to define information in that way, if you want to define it instead of information as a change in where supply is, uh, is equaling demand, you can do that as well. You can define it however you want. The simple fact is order flow correlates with future price movements. Okay, so order flow is the thing that is 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 jostling around prices. So you need to update markets. On the same order that order flow, on the same the speed that order flow arrives. So, uh, uh, I, you know, with a co-author, we developed a, a model um, that actually takes in the statistical properties of order flow, does some optimization on on uh, liquidity providers pricing that order flow because that order flow is a noisy signal of what the equilibrium price is. And then we do a simple thing. We just batch it together into separate, uh, very short-term <coughs> auctions. And we vary the, 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 the speed of these auctions, or the, late, the, the time interval of, of these auctions. And, and uh, we, 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 we try to uh, determine the optimal time interval of those auctions. And it ends up being, if you put everything in, around 0.2 to 0.9 seconds for a typical security. So that analysis is suggesting that uh, there is no real advantage to liquidity by going to markets that are that much faster than 0.2 to 0.9 seconds. Except for what Peter said, which is to run faster. Well, that's exactly party. right. No, the, the idea is, to, is, is that this is analysis for end investors. This is an analysis that says whether or not uh, markets, that speed is, is, helping, is helping end investors who truly want to uh, interact with the market and have uh, uh, maximum liquidity when they interact with the market. Chest has some comment here. Yeah, so I, 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 I mean, to some extent, out there as a, as a critic of make or take, because of the conflict of interest. Yes, you have. I, I, I have some reasons, yeah. Well, even, um, so I'm on, the, I'm on the new equity market structure committee, and even, yeah. the, even some industry speculation that that's my that? agenda. That's Yours and, and Matt Andreessen, the pioneer of the practice, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but let me ask you the thought. So I'm, 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 I've been, because of the agency, Issues uh, in the last couple of years, I've been somewhat critical of of, of, of make or take model. But I, I, you know, I think about it as an agency theorist. I wonder a little bit why are the disclosures that are being made in, inadequate. I was in particular. Let me ask it in a couple of ways. Um, um, to, to, why 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 doesn't the the competitive why doesn't in fact the competitive equilibrium force the rebating back to the to the client of the fee, of the of the fees, in which case all of this would be internalized. That would be one form of it. Alternatively, why don't the disclosure, why don't the 605, 606 types types of disclosures um, at a kind of more aggregate level kind of clean up clean up clean 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 up the, the problem? Well, I'm chomping at the bit to answer that. I mean, having um, dealt with um, rebates in my former job, and of course now they've disclosed it, you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that get pocketed um, within the firm. 
and um, the disclosures themselves <coughs> are, are inadequate. So when you start with inadequate disclosures, and this is something now we've written, uh, I think 10 or 15 comment letters on. Our last one went to Steve Luparello to you know say we need to modernize 605 and 606. In order to drive and change behavior, one of the first things you have to have is transparency of data. And we don't have that today. And since we don't have transparency or even access to a lot of the data, it makes it very, very difficult to um, change the behavioral practices in the marketplace. Chris, what did you think about the Barrett's article that actually tried to link 606, 605 back to the world? What yeah, you so about? you guys might disagree, but um, I, well, I love the quote to healthy markets that we got. So um, Robert's talking about Barron's just put an, uh, an article out that said retail investor wins. Um, I don't necessarily agree with it, but I will say I was um, enamored, and we had actually worked with um, Bill Alper quite a bit in helping him set up the wiki on it. I've never seen a reporter go through so much extent to actually pull data in to create a formula, to disclose the formula, and I think he did just about as best of a job as you could do in terms of showing what that marketplace was. Now, it wasn't very good. It, yeah. Right, and it, it wasn't very good because of course the data itself isn't very good and doesn't tell you a whole lot in the space. Um, it, it, the other um, interesting aspect to your question, we track payment order flows as well too. And, um, a large majority of the retail brokers have been working through the financial information forum uh, to disclose um, attributes on an apples to apples basis across firms on how their order flows are executed. Now again, I, I don't expect much out of it, but what's been interesting is payment order flow rates have come down considerably uh, as a result of that. So. Um, uh, my former Ameritrade, um, some of their payments were down by 22%. Um, one quarter to the next, Fidelity's payments were down 66% um, in anticipation of some of the disclosures. Um, I think the disclosures themselves were actually prompted by, um, uh, well, media attention and um, increased regulatory pressure on it. Um, and, you know, in many ways, regulatory pressure can, can do a go a long way to change behavior uh, in absence of banning it, which I don't think you should ban payments at all because they'll just morph up into midget tossing or jet trips and you know, <laughs> all kinds of things that we don't want to talk about. So I think, so I'd like to expand on it just a, a quick second. Um, the, 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 payments, the payment for order flow and, and, and these reports, um, I, I think the, the, the retail trader at home, and first of all, I think it should be acknowledged that 85, 90% of retail is actually in Vanguard ETFs, BlackRock ETFs, mutual funds, and it's not the day trader clicking through E-Trade and Schwab, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're often ignored in this conversation. Secondly, the way the, uh, um, the Barron's piece treated the retail trader, he's never had it better. He's never had it better as long as he chooses to be aggressive. You know, in other words, market order or market limit order or across the spread. For, for, for that, he's treated well because maybe the Citadel paid for it. They'll get a, you know, some nonsensical amount of price improvement, which is absurd, all right? And in the interim, <coughs> what did Citadel buy? A free option on that order to execute it versus a stale quote. Because Citadel, that's direct feeds, and the quote that it's executing off is stale, it's yeah. the SIP. Mm -hmm. So for that free option they pay for it, even if in, in benign times, in calm times like now, it really makes no difference, all right? It probably doesn't make much of a difference whether it's going to an, routed to an exchange or whether the Citadel is buying it. But in bad times, the worst performers during the flash crash were the wholesalers who cherry-picked which orders they wanted to interact and provide liquidity to, and they exhausted the rest out, you know, like Randolph and Mortimer Duke, zoom, okay, to the exhaust the public exchanges who couldn't handle them. So that's what I mean when this distorts, um, we have to think about how these practices uh, work out in times of stress. Yeah, and I think that gets uh, back to a lot of the data uh, as well. So while 
you know, and, and I know we want to talk about what is HFT, which, which I'm excited to talk about, but um, without the data, you've got this SIP price and you've got the direct feed price and you've got an incredible arbitrage opportunity in between that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we look at something, again, getting back to Bill Albert's report, well, according to the SIP data, these were fantastic executions. But were they fantastic executions according to the direct feed At time of entry. At time of entry, mm -hmm. right? And that is something, of course, we don't know because we don't have the data, and that data is not available. And then again, Robert and Shane, to point out their work, they pointed out what happens to a retail limit order, right? So, you know, Joe Retail doesn't want to cross the spread. He wants to be passive because it's, it's better for me. I buy it cheaper. I'm buying it a penny or two pennies cheaper. So what happens when they go on the New York Stock Exchange versus another exchange, which I know you don't like to mention, so I'm not going to mention it. <coughs> the outcome was very different. If, you, if you've been on the other exchange, the, uh, the, the price moved away from the retail investor much more substantially than if you bid on the New York Stock Exchange. All right, That tells some things about the majority of the participants, and yet the retail brokers still sent it there. So Barron's, yeah, the guy who's crossing the spread, as long as you're aggressive and as long as you don't mind giving someone for free an option to trade against you, uh, against the slow quote, it's a pretty decent experience. But if you're passive and you're a retail buyer, you know, these, the day clickers, um, it's not a good experience. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, I, I just I happen to have a paper to address all these questions. <laughs> Uh, but think about broader. Uh, think broader. Uh, I, I want to keep a general. Cut the chase. Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, I mean, I mean, think about what's the biggest and main thing marketing in the world. Actually, it's this credit card. So think about it. actually, if you use a credit card, actually, you make the quick, you get the cash rebate. Then the first question actually is the equivalent to how much your trading decision depends on the rebate of the card. Something equivalent. That. And the second question actually is like, if make take structure a unit, what does that mean? That means if no card can give cash back, what will happen? Guess what? There will, there will be much less credit card because then the credit card actually only compete on one dimension. It's like the total charge to the merchant and the card users. So actually, my prediction of, uh, of my model actually is basically. The main take fee actually is the driver of US market fragmentation. Basically, it's like when the end users cannot neutralize the fee, exchange can set two different fee structures. That's like the tick size in credit card market. Uh, market. Yeah. What is that? It's no surcharge. That means if a merchant can charge different price for different cash rebate, then there will be also much less cards. Because, I mean, your cash rebate, they will pass a different price to you. It, I think if you think maker taker is driving fragmentation, then you're overlooking some other factors. So, for but example, it's one of those factors. Getting yeah, paid for market data, for example, uh, that's a, a huge factor. Take take the new bats direct edge combination now. You've got bats and direct edge. Like you have two exchanges with almost the exact same rebate structure, and they're keeping them around. That's also in my world. Right? That's, that's, that's also in my world. Where we get come on? Well, that's the difference. Because there's because there's under, uh, the other incentive of market, market data. data yeah, right? yeah, it pays the big the percentage yeah, of the, the, the big yeah. secret yeah. incentive. Yeah, well, so um, I just want a quick note on that. Um, I, I don't think it's a good idea for government to mandate pricing structures. Yeah. I think that yeah, yeah, that's fine. Right? So it's yeah. like regular credit card. Industry. Yes, exactly. So, so what kind of HFT strategies are robust to trading in the IEX? And then can you talk about how nice is it or not nice is it for an institutional trader to trade in the IEX with the speed bump versus in a dark form and some of these other places? You mean me personally? Yeah, and the HFT. Yeah, I, I actually, so I never ran a, a trade at IEX, but I know there's a lot of HFT that are. And I mean, they market aggressively to HFT. I haven't met one they haven't talked to yet. Um, I, I honestly don't think the speed bump's all that big of a deal. It slows down everybody the same. So, like, it doesn't, it's not something that prevents HFT from being in the market. Um, my personal experience is I, every HFT firm I talk to, when I say, why are you not at IEX? And it's kind of like, yeah, because the marketing pisses me off, so I give them my money. So, um, <laughs> so it, it, the, the speed bump itself isn't keeping them out. And I actually think that the speed bump just is, is an interesting thing to try. Um, I like the idea of market-driven changes. I like the idea of people trying things out. Uh, every time I hear somebody say, you know, this is a great new market structure, we should try it. And I, I've been one of those people trying to come up with great new market structures. 
awesome. As soon as somebody can fund doing it, try it. I think that's the way to go. I'd rather do that than like government mandated uh, pilot programs, for example. And if you can get Lewis to write about it, that helps a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I trade in IEX, yeah. and I, tr I mean, I trade everywhere. I have, you know, not only do I have my own connections to exchanges, um, my firm also uses third party technologies independent. We'll use SunGuard's Fox River. We'll use, you know, Credit Suisse. We'll use Knight. We'll use, I, if I mentioned who, uh, who else we use in this room, it would, uh, your jaws would drop. Um, and, I, and I'm actually going to mention it, and I am going to say it. We even have a partnership with Virtu, where I'm, we have shared technology for us to, ac to access the public quote better than the mousetraps that are being offered by the exchanges. So I'm a big, big believer in the private sector figuring it out, and, uh, and, and my business model depends on it. But the problem is, um, uh, and it, before I go on, let me just address the IEX. So we, we rest on IEX, and the reason why IEX works is maybe a little bit from, um, this, from the speed bump. Uh, and I get chunky fills there, but I also get chunky fills in, in liquid net when I use them and, and in some other, some other things. Uh, but the reason why it works is because they don't have the complicated conditional orders, all these leaky, almost disgusting order types that virtually every other dark pool has. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you've heard the term conditional orders, and conditional orders has been sold to the buy side, the institutions, Hey, you want to buy 100,000 shares of something? I'll put 20,000 in ITG, 20,000 here, 20,000, 20,000 there. And if a contra side shows up in, in any one of them, or I put 100,000 in each of the other five venues, you know, before it automatically trades, there's a firm up invitation process. So, you know, I'm conditionally represented to buy stock in five venues. A seller comes into one of the venues. Instead of it automatically trading, the seller says, I invite you to reiterate your bid, yeah. okay? And the re reiteration firm up process happens and a trade happens. Sounds great. Almost every institution was like, that makes sense. <coughs> Fragmented marketplace, which sucks to interact with, with this pinwheel where all my orders are going, this is a way that'll make it easier and for me to execute blocks. I'm all for it. Sounds great. How are the conditional orders actually taking, uh, being used in dark pools? <laughs> they rolled them out for the institutions with the real intention of rolling them out for the, for the electronic liquidity providers. So the high frequency guys in the dark pool have 200 shares offered in the pool. I come into the pool with an algo or myself to rest to buy 500 shares or 1,000 shares. It doesn't automatically trade. They get a, a message from the dark pool. Eh, there's a buyer at your price. <laughs> you you want to you wanna execute? You know? And guess what? 75% of the time, the ELPs don't execute. And what do you think their next step is? They take the offer ahead of me on the lit markets. Going to your point, what happens in the dark is so intertwined with what happens in the lit markets, and you can't do something to affect one without affecting the other. A payment for order flow, free pings, free, for a free, free look for a fill, anywhere. For retail, for institutions, uh, the, the original pioneer of Payment for order flow was Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff. Yeah. Okay. Rest his soul. Well, I, I, the other thing is I can't agree with with Sal more more strongly on this. And it, it's funny a lot of people see like MI or any HFT firm and think it's like oh they must be a complete polar opposite. We passionately agree on a lot of stuff, which is funny. Um, one of the we actually I did a panel with his partner Joe once uh, at, at an event and afterwards everybody was like man you guys went at it. And Joe and I looked at each other we're like. Well, we're both really loud, but we said the exact same thing the whole time. <laughs> you know, we were, we were like passionately agreeing. Um, but like, I can't agree with him more on this. There is zero reason in today's day and age where we need anything more than a limit order. First off, market orders should dawn to one of the riskiest things out there. It exacerbated the flash crash just as much as any type of trading style. Um, but the other thing is like, we need limit orders and limit orders only. All the other stuff Amen. is exchanges trying to get, on the lit pools, it's exchanges trying to get an edge in a world where they are forced to route orders to their competitors. Think about that. Think about going side tangent here. Think about going to Home Depot. You're in the checkout line, you've driven there, you've picked your thing off the counter, you're stepping up to the cash register, and the 19 year old at the cash register says, oh, I'm sorry, sir, but I just got word that Lowe's has this at a better price for you. 
So not only can I not sell this to you, but I'm gonna put you in a Home Depot van, I'm gonna drive you over there, and I'm gonna do the execution for you, and then we'll bring you back here to get you in your car. Like, it's ridiculous. Uh, and so a lot of these order types are around uh, to work around this, this kind of anti-competition. So, so we actually, we, we track all the SRO filings on a monthly basis, and this is really interesting. Um, post Reagan MS, there was a dramatic increase in uh, SRO filings, so exchange filings. On average, those are 100 a month. And on average, 60% um, or actually even more are either fee changes, so adjusting what the rebate structure is on a tiered basis, or an order type change uh, that's in the marketplace. Um, most of those order types actually don't even get included within any of the 605 and 606 stats um, whatsoever, and a lot of that data is just devoid from the marketplace. Well, the, the exchanges are a little bit better now in disclosing this stuff uh, than they have been in the past. As yeah. Heim Bodek and the Direct Edge Fine uh, and, and other, and NASDAQ actually started cleaning up its order book in August 2012. Yeah. They made a whole bunch of changes which, oh, we're changing this, you know, and codifying and so what we really meant to say is how the rule works and what they were finally is getting their dis the disclosure of of how, you know, queue jumping took place on NASDAQ as well and, and fixing it. Uh, but and that hasn't happened in the dark markets at all. Not in at fact, all. so we um, we work with a lot of buy side firms and um, we went out to all the dark pools with our own homebrew questionnaire um, with a lot of data. Um, how, you know, how does your matching engine work? Do you use the SIP feed or direct feeds if you've got a midpoint match? How does that midpoint match work in relation to the order? Um, we got five replies. The rest um, went and reply, and we've, we've even gotten some buy side firms behind it, and have had great difficulty in, in that regard. In the in the New York Attorney General Schneiderman versus Barclays case, there is a docket. Please email me. I'll send you the links to all the public documents that both sides have filed since their beginning. Why am I following it? I'm not a Barclays customer. I don't hate Barclays. But I, for me, it's fascinating reading the, the legal transpirings. And one of the exhibits, there is a slide of what a sophisticated electronic market maker, um, they did a really bad job of redacting the name so you can actually make out the name of who it is. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, but anyhow, so it's what this ELP is asking of Barclays, okay? And it was very telling. So. Some things are, okay, um, do you offer, you know, what's your point of presence, the latency turnaround time for this? Okay, how is your, describe the, you know, time price priority in your pool? D describe the segmentation. Do you have any special rooms for specific clients? All right, I'm reading that like, special rooms? No one ever told me about special rooms. <laughs> so you keep reading, all right, do you offer, um, you know, uh, uh, price offsets, which is a way for them to get around sub penny pricing in the dark. You know, all these different things, and you run, run down. And to Barclays credit, they answered a lot of those questions appropriately. No, we do not offer that, okay? Um, however, the fact that this ELP has a canned form that it's asking all the dark pools tells you that some of them are, in fact, absolutely providing that information. And so the disclosure varies. Your treatment in the dark pool varies based on how good a negotiator you are. Yeah. Do I get the conditional order? Or I can only you know, kiss you 20% of the time and 80% of the time go over to my girlfriends. Um, it's, the treatment is different. And if the SEC and FINRA stepped in and these things were mandatory, I think you would see the number going to fragmentation. The number of dark pools would go from 40 to 12 yeah. overnight. All right? And if you lower the access fee for the exchanges. So getting, getting back to this uh, definition issue and thinking yeah. about the definition and, and regulation, um, you know that, that there's a lot of um, proprietary trading firms that you know look like they may be HFT, and a lot of them uh, do register as broker dealers with the SEC. Um, but some of those choose not to <coughs> to have be regulated by FINRA. And I know at the beginning, Sal said he was nervous being in a room. With SEC people, I'm but he not. didn't say he was nervous being in a room with somebody from FINRA. Um, <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> 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 I'm actually nervous. 
sort of anything of monetary value. Really thinking about when they're choosing whether or not to be a broker dealer and when they're choosing whether or not, I don't know, choice whether or not to be a broker dealer, but. Um, choosing whether or not to be a FINRA member, what it, what goes into that? Cost. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's it, FINRA gouges you like yeah, there's no tomorrow, and, and <laughs> yeah, the industry isn't really happy with uh, FINRA as um, you know just the the regulator that that oversees them in that regard. Cost is a big consideration. I, if I could avoid putting another dime in the FINRA pocket, I would. Yeah. They, there's, and, and I keep hearing all these stories about how much extra money they have at the end of the budgetary cycle, and it just drives me nuts because it's like, why are two, you, $2 billion? One dollars. of the reasons the markets aren't as transparent is all the data they collect is so damn hard to get. you got to pay a ton of money to get it. <laughs> can, can I just come back real quick to, to this idea of complexity and order types and everything else? So I, I want to play devil's advocate, not because I necessarily have this viewpoint, but I want to see whether or not this is a valid viewpoint. Um, and, and I understand the fairness issues, but there's all the other issues that um, th these, the, the complexity in the market may allow liquidity providers to separate toxic from non-toxic order flow, separate um, smarter individuals from not smart individuals, the directional traders, and so on. And it's in the liquidity <coughs> provider's interest always to separate order flow, to understand what order flow is toxic, what order flow is not, and so on. And as long as liquidity provision is a competitive enterprise, you know, they're going to make money. But as long as it's competitive and everyone under, and, and you have enough of these competitors who are just as smart as the other guys yeah. on the liquidity providing side, then they should reduce the overall profits. And now the complexity is not really dealing with the overall profits of those guys. It's more dealing with the distribution among the directional investors, whether you have separation or not. And I think that's kind of an interesting question. Um, and I'm not sure what, what, yeah, I, what, yeah. what, what we should care about. Should we care about uh, everything being completely fair? Or should we care that, well, you know, it's actually a good thing that retail investors whose order flow is much less toxic are separated from the from the institutional order flow because they get better prices when they're separated. Or is that, you know, oh, you can't do that because that's that's a fairness issue. So some of the complexity is is in there to a, to in, in, in its real effect, I don't think, as long as liquidity provision is a competitive enterprise, isn't to increase the, the rents of, of the liquidity providers. It's more to do a separation in toxic in the in toxic versus non-toxic and, and, and all the different yeah, types of yeah. order flow except, except of course in the case of direct edge right which just got fined 15 million dollars for not properly disclosing how their sure. order types worked and sure. I think I, I think that's part of the problem well dis that. disclosure fairness and 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 I agree with that uh, we should always have that but then the complexity issue itself if everything is disclosed and it, can we have payment for order flow if, if and, and target that, that towards uh, uh, orders that are less toxic? And so the problem is hard. Well, that's that's what what yeah, 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 sure. So I'll, I'll go briefly. The, the problem with, uh, I think, the complexity right now is it does actually, in a way, segregate out uh, toxic from non toxic, but it's also so damn complex that it means a lot of liquidity providers don't have access to the non toxic. So when I'm on a dark pool, when I'm in a lit venue as a liquidity provider, it's almost all toxic by the time it gets to me. When I'm in a dark pool, at most dark pools even I don't have great access. So I spent a year and a half trying to get one major dark pool to disclose to me when I finally get filled. Because they kept saying, oh, 100 million shares a day come through here. And I was like, I'm not seeing enough volume with the size I'm putting out there at the aggressive prices to justify this number. It took me going out with their sales reps multiple times, taking them to the Cubs game, getting them blasted. Um, and I finally found out that there were seven different stages of liquidity providers that got filled before I did, including their internal liquidity provision desk. Yeah. So like, yes, toxic was separated from non-toxic, but guess what I saw? I saw toxic. I didn't see one bit of non-toxic. So now the quotes that I'm providing to the market the quotes that all regulatory fairness are based around, because I'm the lit market quote provider, is only dealing with toxic flow. You only get exhaust. Yeah, so if I'm only getting exhaust, what's that do to my quotes? So what's that do to what we're viewing as the MBBO that we're basing regulatory decisions around? And spreads have been actually inching up, I think reflecting yeah. that over the last few months. But going back to your issue over fairness um, and customer segmentation, uh, you know, you talked about, well, the retail trader should feel good. So um, the E-Trade the e guy, the, you know, not the 90% that's in the mutual funds, let's, let's talk about just the E-Trade e day trader, the baby, 
right? The baby, when he trades, um, gets some nonsensical price improvement Five nines. versus a, a stale quote, and that's considered a benefit because he's considered uninformed and Citadel wants, you know, everyone wants to be on the other side of him. Citadel does, and, and they're always at the top of all the dark blue routing tables. But they're again, number that, one, they're just two, right? you're seven. There's multiple, there's multiple uh, uh, <coughs> By entities doing, that do this, right? And, and but, they, should, they should drive the... But what, and, and what that's done to but the it, market... But it's not because the disclosures are inadequate. The yeah. disclosures are inadequate, but he's even saying, what if the disclosures were there? Would you yeah. be okay with it? Well, again, this is a devil advocate. It it's just, necessarily yeah. my opinion. I mean, it's just, I think that, that, that's, I think, yeah. where the discussion should be, not necessarily on whether or not it drives up the rents of the liquidity providers, more it, it's... It's allowing separation. So, so, so is that a good or bad thing? Maybe I'm just not going to get this that. point across go real ahead. quick. I just want to get this point across. Even if the disclosures are there, okay, and as far as I'm concerned, every SEC person I've ever talked to said, well, if the disclosure's there, we just got to get the disclosure better, then you're all the big boys and girls and you can figure it out, okay? If the, if the disclosure's there, I'm still against the segmentation because retail is off over here by Citadel, UBS, Citigroup, uh, Susquehanna, you know, whatever. Folks like me, institutions, and, law, and which is a big part of retail, are spinning around in the dark and dark blue routers. You know, bing, 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 in the most ill-designed rat nest with so much complexity and no, and it, it, it's silly. And the lit market, who everyone is referencing, yeah. is him. Going like this, and and really like quickly, this because all I get right. is crap. In those and whenever markets. I want to try to hit your hand, yeah. you're really good at going like this. You yeah. know what I mean? It's uh, I, I think the most robust market, which is going to yield um, a safe order book in good times and bad, as well as better reflect accurate price discovery. Okay, I feel more comfortable if I go into you know if I'm going diamond shopping. Instead of three diamond dealers who are all cousins on the same street <laughs> and going and shopping among them, in other words, shopping on the lit markets with three major market, market makers, I feel more comfortable if when I'm spending $10,000, well, I spent $2,000, my wife's dying. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm spending $2,000, okay, I want to get, if I want to make, I, I don't want to get the best deal, I just want to make sure yeah. I'm not taking advantage of it. It's fair, right? Yeah. And I feel fair. Uh, it's fair when there's many diverse participants participating in the same pool, and I don't feel that now. Yeah. So that's exactly why we're big proponents of, and it's funny because I used to be a, um, an anti-proponent for a trade-out rule, uh, but then I saw the flash crash happen, and I saw how the options markets uh, actually fared much, much better than the equity markets. So you didn't have that downfall, and even today when we look, and, and I know it's not all the liquidity is not there because you have speed bumps, but if you take um, an underlying uh, in the options market, compare that to the, the underlying stock, you find more displayed liquidity in the option market than the equity market. And it's because the options markets have a quasi trade out rule, so you just can't internalize the trade. And you know, once I saw that, that really changed my, my thought process on that a, a trade act could help restore a lot of the, the BBO within the marketplace uh, and curb some of the internalization that goes on. So is it fair when you have a market and some, uh, a market center is improving by a thousandth of a cent, which the, you know, those improvements have gone up dramatically, uh, in order to jump in front of your resting limit order on the lim lit exchange. There should be a more meaningful give up if you're going to do that. Not to say ban it entirely, and, but there should be a more meaningful give up. And I think the more you don't segment the flood, I think the more you put it all into the same venues, I actually think the better. Because so, you know, Sal referenced the flickering back and forth a few times. And I like to think of it like, I don't know if anybody's ever adopted. I didn't mean it in a denigrating way. No, no, no. But it, I, it comes from a, like, it makes sense, right? Has anybody adopted an abused dog? Or just think of an abused dog. If you have a dog that's been hit over and over and over again, a toxic owner, let's say, <laughs> you reach out your hand to pet that dog, he backs away. Even if all you want to do is pet him. But the more a dog gets the balance or more petting, the more they stay there. If the flow wasn't so damn toxic on lit venues, quotes would last there longer. 
concerned. They wouldn't back away. And they wouldn't be down to 118 yeah, shares per if, trade. If, if, yeah. if we got a, if there's always going to be toxic flow. People who try to protect themselves from toxic flow are actually trying to rig the game in their favor. You're always going to have some flow that's toxic because somebody's always going to have a better view than you in the market, right? <laughs> uh, a founder of the company I used to work for used to say, uh, as soon as you do a trade with somebody, you realize they got the better side of it. Right, like every trade, that was his view. And it's kind of true. Um, like, but the more petting there is, as opposed to just flat out abuse in the lit markets, like the more those quotes are gonna stick where they are, the less flickering you're gonna see, the more solid, the more size there's gonna be. And the problem is, is those lit markets are just, there's not good flow in those lit markets. And so um, we're going back to incentives. I, I got Chest, uh, what would you guys Well, let me, I'll follow up later. But, you know, so Sal, I, you know, I, I represent retail and um, I do think the differentiation, the ability to allow retail to go to certain venues and Reg NMS in particular, which kind of forced the fragmentation, has been a boom for retail investors and self-directed investors. And I believe that we've gotten to the point with the fragmentation and the, and the fee structures getting so complex that it came a little bit at the back of institutional, which is, again, most of retail investors are going through the ETFs or going through the mutual funds. But I'm not clear on what you're saying the solution is because I'm, I'm confused between the problems you have with dark pools, which dark pools didn't come out, come, they came about as a solution for the fragmentation for institutions versus no. NYSE and NASDAQ being a solution. Dark pools, dark pools came about because broker dealers wanted to avoid paying 30 mils points. on the exchanges. Yeah. Yeah. So Credit Suisse had its own dark pool and tried to get him and 19 other people like him and me and everyone else in the pool so that when they did get an order, they can execute it and find the other side so who of the are their pool. Who are their customers? Their customers are high frequency. Their customers are... Well, why would a high frequency go into a dark pool if there wasn't a buyer? Why does a high frequency make a market on any destination? Because they're well, trying to reasons. make a market. They want, they want to interact with non-toxic flow. That's, that's right. what they want. Well, and so it gets advertised often as being non-toxic, but really it's already the leftovers. It's like one step right. removed from a lit venue by the time it gets to you. It's picked over, but it's still got a little meat on it. It's, yeah, the yeah, exactly. fragmentation <laughs> argument, if you represent retail, and, yeah. and I, I assume you mean like the retail that the industry talks small, about. Small self-directed okay. 200 share orders. There is, there is absolutely, <coughs> there's no fragmentation for you. Your order is being executed in Citadel. Yeah. Okay. And that's actually, that's, yeah. that's, that's, there's no yeah. fragmentation. Yeah. The problem I have is there's only, there's two firms that make up most of the market share and there's three of the firms that are wealthy. So I worry about the high level, I worry about the market structure from the fact that there's not many participants. So the next right. time we have volatility intraday, when the Fed is no longer creating a put on the market, um, I, I do worry about it on the flashback. I would ask you, since you do you lot, a lot of self-directed or um, and 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 s the smaller orders, two the average retail order is what seven to nine hundred shares. Mm -hmm. you know, and figure this out: retail, the small guy in the market, <coughs> right, is seven to nine hundred shares, and the average trade size on an exchange and a dark pool is one hundred and twenty shares. That's absurd. Okay, yeah. talk about inefficient. But anyway, the the seven the, when you execute, what do you think would happen if there was no payment for order flow? If, let's say you use an Ameritrade platform, like my money manager does, all right, and that and he, you know, sends the order and it, to use an Ameritrade platform and it gets executed at Citadel. Ameritrade collects a, a payment. I get a roughly equivalent price. Your customer gets roughly equivalent price. If that were all to go away, and your order were to be sent down to an exchange, you know, a club or you know, clubs are bad because that's no competition. But forty venues suck. All right, somewhere in between, there's there's a good number, and it goes down to a public quote with diverse participants. Um, do, do you really think all of a sudden you're going to go back to a 25 cent spread? And you're going, to, I don't think so. No. And, yeah. and actually, the more flow you see going to the lit venues, like the more flow that's actually going there, the less important speed becomes. That's right. right. It says because you're not racing to get that 200 lot that comes in. You know that at that price there might be 2,000. But but are you supporting you know Spectre saying you know basically I want I want to play, create a monopoly in equities and then I do worry because then I'll go down and buy that and it'll cost me fifty dollars and my commission is two ninety five and that fifty dollars will get passed through to the customer so I just think that you know create you know turn uh, the question I have is not 
I understand what your issue is. I, I'm trying to figure out what you're advocating for. So I know you want to kind of move back some someplace, but I where, how far back do you want to go and how you want to get there? All right, and I don't think it's the SEC or FINRA's or anyone's, anyone's ability or right to determine, um, to mandate what's the correct speed in the market yeah. or what's the correct um, amount of fragmentation or split between lit and dark. I think if you eliminate payment for order flow, okay, make or taker, payments to Citadel, payments in the dark pools, all right, I have no problem that he can trade cheaper than me. He, he trades a lot more, all right? I have no problem that Hertz can buy a Ford cheaper than I can buy a Ford. But this complexity in the make or taker and the payment for order flow, uh, if you were to get rid of this, I think the market's going to decide the correct number of venues and the correct speed. So I kind of, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that's more of a problem in search of a solution. It, it, but if, um, he's a, if he's a participant that has cheaper costs, then why wouldn't I have cheaper costs? You're just talking around zero. So if, if retail goes to an exchange, New York Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange says, I want to charge $5 a trade. But you're a market maker, I'm going to charge you $2 a trade. Why is that not different than payment for order flow? That's, a, that's a, an incentive, an inducement through financial means to get the participants to interact with your exchange. And I, I think agree. his incentive doesn't need to be a maker. I think no. we're all overlooking. He just talked about how crappy it is to make a market and always get exhaust. Yeah. Maybe the reward, maybe the only reward for bidding <laughs> and offering should be that you're going to get treated well and you have a fair shot at not being, you know, on a different playing field than everyone else on the market, and that you're actually trying to buy the stock because you think it's going to go up or sell it because it's going to go down. Yeah, and, and remember my first comment, I'm all for getting rid of Maker Taker. But to do that, you got to get rid of all this other stuff, like right. payment for order flow, the internalization, sub take pricing in a dark pool to keep stuff from going to a Remember, do we have to address membership fees and market data fees? And yeah. I think we'll be in a in a in a. Actually, I don't know if you have to address. Oh, the, there's the no perfect. I actually don't know if you have to address market data fees. Well, it's part of the equation. No, because here's the thing: is if you want better market, if you want faster market data or more enriched market data that's out there, uh, if you need it, you'll pay for it. If it makes your strategy better, you pay for it. Right? My customers say that's unfair. You have an unfair advantage. So, so pay I, for it. I, I, or they go to someone who does. I don't. I don't agree with the notion that you should. The, the government should ban payment for order flow. I think that should be a natural force in the marketplace. But I think what the what the problem is, and uh, and again, I go back to it. You know, we've been sitting here trying to talk about defining what is HFT, and you know, there's panels and panels on that. Uh, a lot of it is just in disclosure and best practices. So those are woefully out of date, and the disclosures are non-existent. So since the disclosures are non-existent, when we think of HFT, HFT is <coughs> Basically, just about every firm in the market today has HFT technology. It's the strategies that they're utilizing that we talk about. So when we hear news arbitrage strategies, oh, those are no good, right? Um, or quote stuffing strategies, you know, there's a lot of angst against that. But if you hear about market making strategies, um, you know, you, you don't get necessarily the feedback or, or the negative reaction in that regard. So by better having data to understand what certain players are doing, you're able to define what it is to mean, what it is to be a market maker, right, or a liquidity provider in the space. But there also needs to be better definitions around that as well, too, um, in terms of like best price obligations, capital requirements, um, I volatility. I think your example on the plus flash crash, I would say that a lot of it had to do has to do with the options market maker's obligations. Number one. Yep. And number two, That's a great you point. talked about trade up, but it's also the options exchanges in in the options world you have to you have to transact on an exchange. That's right. Yeah. Which yeah. I you know, believe it or not, I'm a yeah. huge supporter of yeah. of that. You know, I yeah. had bad experiences with New York and Nasdaq as a you know, as a participant in the marketplace. And I think Red Red NMS solved that. And I think we've gone too far yeah. now. So I, I guess my question is I wasn't thinking I was I believe that from what I've heard from industry participants is the institutional experience has really been degraded, particularly in the last couple of years, and we need to address it. But the question I have is how, and how does that impact other participants? So we were, I was talking with Austin earlier this morning, with Austin and Paul, and uh, ITG came out with this a study on transaction costs. So first of all, um, Peter's ex-lobbying group 
And I always say hey, lobbying group. We never um, lobby. And I always, any lobby I hate a lot. So regardless, Peter's a great guy. And, and anyway, so we're, and we're not a lobbying group. We have we're, no presence on the Hill. We're, we're not registered lobbyists. Lobby, yes. That's OK. <laughs> but um, you know, everyone says, oh, transaction costs, they, you know, in 1987, no one answered the phone, and there was a 50 cent or a dollar spread, okay? And they go back there. They conveniently don't go back to 2003 when we had penny wide spreads, <laughs> uh, electronic order books, and Herzog Heine Gedueled offering 50,000 share auto X on Yahoo. <laughs> on Yahoo. Yeah. Um, ITG did a transaction cost study of institutional traders from 2003 to now, so 12 years. Through Reg NMS, institutional transaction costs have not budged. They're, they're exactly the same. You can look at it on the chart. All right, implementation shortfall um, when you're executing a large order. Um, and that's why I say institutional, not the, the, you know, the spread. The spread is pretty much similar in 2003 to what it is now as well, by the way. But what does that tell me? That tells me that all of these, all of the arms race, all of the, not only the exchanges and the dark pools that have set up, but all the latency <coughs> infrastructures and folks that sell speed, and all the Adnan Khashoggi's in the market, all of these investments, now all of the uh, policing that the buy side has to do, you know, Boston Company and Vesco, they all got to hire teams of really smart guys to make sure and analyze each trade versus the NBBO and where did I, you know, because they have a fiduciary duty, right? And sooner or later, someone's going to have a class action lawsuit, and they have the fiduciary duty. Thank God I don't have the fiduciary duty because all I got to do is make sure I don't sell an old lady a muni bond in a 401k, and I'm good. All right? <laughs> it's not fair. But with all of what we've spent, and all of what we've invested in, and all of these, the speed race to zero, institutional trading costs have not come down. Okay. So who's made money? All the guys in the intermediate, you know, all the guys in the middle, the inserted intermediaries, mm -hmm. and that's a problem. When I first started in the business, I was never a market maker. I was never a specialist. We sold against them. I worked at Instanet. We leveraged technology to bring natural buyers and sellers together directly without middlemen. Somewhere around the turn of the century, the the model changed. And people started uh, leveraging technology to insert the maximum number of intermediaries between natural buyers and sellers. And that's where we are today. And that's why we have to, the pendulum has to swing back. We have time for one last question. I spoke too much, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anyone? OK. I think I have one final comment is that I think we lack a dark pool presence for the, for the panda. So next year, probably we're going to bring the dark pool guy here. <laughs> because if you, if you can find one that won't no, be a jet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be behind the screen with their face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>